The label crashed and burned because I told Hobson he didn't work that hard. You're just a snake and you and Payne are both broke as f over 30 year old failures. I just turned 40. That's a really true statement. That's crazy. Um, let's talk about it. What's going down? It's the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast. This is episode 81. And the MEC podcast is powered by BeatStars, BeatStars.live. Actually, the entire MEC is powered by BeatStars. We're live on Mondays and Thursdays. Why, why, who's messaging me? Come on, guys. We're live on Mondays and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time for a free music business mentorship program. Tune in. Be there. Participate. It's totally interactive. Dame is before before we jump into today, I'm I'm starting text marketing webinars every Monday um for the foreseeable future. Starting today, this podcast comes out on a Monday. I just want to get that out before if you're interested in learning more about text marketing, how to use it, what strategies you should be using. It's more of like an office hours more so than a webinar, so that we can talk to individual people and, and kind of address individual concerns because it's sponsored by fan connect so that's the platform i use um, and consult for uh it, you'll get more information on the the mec instagram but going forward every monday I believe it's going to be at 1 30 pacific um we're going to do some text marketing office hours slash and webinar. this is this is for producers too just to be clear because fan connect is a beat stars integration Yes, yes. It's for producers. It's for anybody with an audience, really. Anybody with a fan base. Um, I use it with my with the comedians I work with. Uh, so yeah, the, it's going to be dope. But I think there's a lot of misinformation about text marketing and the cost and how you should use it. We're going to talk about all that um, and hopefully get some folks going. So so yeah, more information on the MEC Instagram. So Dame, uh, you and Hobson have reunited for a podcast, a pretty long podcast. How, how long is it? Four hours? Yeah, it's four hours. We broke it up into four parts and re we released one every day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we record this podcast on a Thursday. So the, the last episode of the Funk Volume podcast just premiered about an hour ago. So everything's out now. Yeah. And that's why I haven't seen part four. I've seen every part up until part four. And, you know, this is Let's let's talk a timeline. Um, so when did when did Funk Volume behind closed doors break up? I, how long how long ago was that? What year was that? So Funk Volume was founded in two thousand eight, and the breakup ridiculousness was early two thousand sixteen. So you know the, the label lasted for seven, a little more than seven years, between seven and eight years. So it's it's basically five years probably not a full five years but five years since everything was public the beef was public the, the breakup was public the disc records were public right yeah so for five years people didn't really know what happened they had Ver hobson's version of, of ill mind eight and, and a lot of interviews he did um but those had very little truth and i would go as far to say as some of them had no truth in them. So that existed for five years. So I endured the, the public lashing. I endured the death threats and the, the ridiculousness because we had a pretty passionate fan base. Um, so I think some of that speaks to the, to the passion of, of what we built, but then a lot of it speaks to the ignorance and you know the dangerousness of some of some artists' platforms and the trust that we put into to, to words of celebrities. And this is why I really hate the term followers because that's what a lot of people do, right? Like, I, I, don't, like, I, don't, like being, I don't like the term followers on social media because in a lot of situations, it's pretty literal. I mean, it's accurate. I'm not saying it's yeah. not accurate. I'm not saying it's not accurate. I just don't like that term. Um, but a lot of people are just followers and a lot of people can't think for themselves. And a lot of people get so invested in the people that they follow that no matter what they say, they soak it up. Right. And I, and I think that's dangerous. And I think that's why artists have to be very careful with their platforms. Um, you know, cause it's, it, it's a power that some people take advantage of. 
Yeah, uh, a lot of people, you know, love watching sports and they're sitting there watching, you know, the Super Bowl and they swear they could have done a better job than, you know, the players. And you know damn well they couldn't because, you know, maybe they have a sprained ankle. Maybe they can't even run a mile. Maybe they, they sleep until two in the afternoon. Um, with the music business, it's it's the same. There are a lot of people on the sidelines who swear they understand paperwork. I would have never signed a contract like that. They swear they know what's going on based on a little bit of information. And as we covered um, in last week's podcast with the whole Ace Hood thing where World Star and Double XL took this really beautiful moment, this beautiful family moment, and injected some inf- misinformation about how plaques work. Uh, the, even the, the, the publications are in on this whole uh, misinformation campaign. And so if the, if the publications, I mean, these are people who are, you know, so-called professionals, if, if even they are misinformed and spreading misinformation at the consumer level, at the level of a fan of a rapper who, who listens to a song and thinks they know the inner workings of a record label and therefore the entire music business, it's, you know, it's bad there. And you were a victim of that. I mean, I'm a victim of that every day, but you were a victim of that specifically. And when Hobson recorded a diss record about you, how many millions of, of listeners? I mean, on YouTube alone, the music video is almost at 100 million. On Spotify and, and the other platforms, I imagine it's, it's pretty close. Yeah, it's, a, it's like at 86 million. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people saw it. And, you know, for people that really knew me, you know, I, I didn't lose anybody that I considered a friend or that actually knew me. Um, Obviously, you didn't keep your distance, and I appreciate you know you you for rocking with me and not believing, you know the drama. Um, I still so haven't I'll, heard the the song. I'm, <laughs> the only song I heard was the um, the back and forth between Funk Volume and uh, Crooked Eye's team because well because I know Crooked Eye and I know you, and then Mike Trampy got involved, and I wanted to laugh at Mike Trampy because of um, the whole sway in the morning math situation and that was hilarious so uh you know, yeah he may he turns me into a meme and i get to make fun of him for math yeah and it and it's unfortunate and but i get it obviously it was a song it was entertaining it was drama uh, you know hopton is a good rapper and he's got a very loyal loyal fan base so i get why it received so much attention you know but those were lies and and people know that that lies travel a lot faster and further than the truth because you know I don't anticipate these this podcast even getting a million views. I, it's not. I mean, some of the episodes just broke ten thousand because the truth isn't that fun and it's exciting. But it but more than that, a lot of people don't want the truth because then they would have to recalibrate their thinking. Right. And I even saw that in the comments, like as as I was premiering the episodes, the comments were like, well, well, why isn't Dame admitting what he did? Why? Why isn't you know, why is it just just Hobson saying what he did? Like, when is Dame going to say what he did? Like, wouldn't you think that if there was something that I wasn't admitting and I'm sitting right in front of Hobson, he would say, hey, well, why didn't you admit to this? Like there's a possibility that what you heard and saw was just completely wrong. There's nothing for me to admit. I said my truth right in front of the man. He said his truth right in front of me. But people are so invested. There has to be. There has to be something that he did. Like that it just has to be because people are so invested. And if what and if you're confronted with the truth, it's going to be hard to swallow. So there has to be something that I'm still holding back or that I'm not saying. And it's unfortunate because I think we see this play out in politics too. Yeah. Yeah. And and I want to pick up on that. Um, I'm just automatically relating it to the one time that, that I co-managed an artist and it was such a nightmare. Um, And it, it, it seems like there were some parallels, correct me if I'm wrong. So 
I was co-managing an artist. I was also on the creative side because I was producing his music. And um, myself and the co-manager were not collecting our manager commission on any of, and we were doing everything, booking, you know, like you were at the beginning with Funk Volume, doing everything, producing, executive producing, booking, managing, um, driving him places, all, all types of stuff, meeting with the family, that kind of thing, because he was younger. He was an adult, but he was younger. And um, we were getting money for him for events, for shows, for features, for endorsements. And um, it it was just that that's finally, after maybe about a year, things started getting bigger. And, and that's a testament to, I think, how talented he was and how strong of a work ethic and how solid of a vision I had and my co-manager had for us to pull that together coming from where, where we're from in just a year. And eventually those show guarantees started jumping from 500 where we're like, we're not going to take commission off $500 started jumping up to, you know, thousands of dollars in, in fees and merchandise and everything. So it's like, okay, cool. Now we need to have a conversation about accounting. And that's when everything really went wrong. I mean, we were butting heads before that, but I feel like the reason things went wrong were was one, we were being too lenient and, and just focusing on investing everything we could into this artist's success. And so we never had those uncomfortable conversations. We're like, look, we're doing all this for him. I, he, he'll appreciate it. And then when it came down to it, it was a shock for us to actually pull the manager commission card and say, okay, now that we've gotten you to this point, it's time that we start splitting things. It's time that we start getting a percentage of what you're making. And because he felt like he was doing everything because he was the face of the, the brand, he didn't owe us anything. And it was actually insulting and disrespectful for us to ask for a cut. And when I looked at the the podcast with you and Hobson, I felt like I was having deja vu where it was like, that's what Hobson was saying. He he let the business slide. He kept saying, Dame, I trusted you on the business. I, I put it all in your hands. And then one day I decided, you know, years later, I want to investigate and see the inner workings. And because he never understood and never took the time to understand what was in the contract, how things broke down. It was suddenly a shock to him and he, his response, and these are his words, was emotional. Yeah, well, it's, it's slight, slightly, well, it's different than the experience you had because we did have a contract in place. The only thing that happened where we didn't have an actual contract in place was our agreement to split his first album 50-50. It, not 50 to the label and 50 to, to Hobson, but like actual 50 to me, 50 to him. But this was because, you know, I worked for two plus years before we even put out product that we could sell because he was still signed to Ruthless. So because I put in so much work in the beginning, you know, we agreed that that project would be 50-50. No other project was split like that. But in the beginning, um, that's what that's what we agreed to. The issue that I had was that, because that and that project didn't make that much money out the gate. Like it was a good boost for us, but it didn't make that much money out the gate. However, about a year down the line, as we started growing more and certain things happened, double XL cover, um, you know, he got on a big song with, with, with Tech Nine and BLB. Uh, he dropped a big video in Ill Mind Four. Then the sales of that album started to pick up, right? So when those with sales started to pick up, and he noticed, and then he realized how much money that was making, he wanted to change the deal. But that's, you know, and I let that go. I let, I let that ride, even though I felt like that was not, that's not cool. Like Hop has this in his mind, like he can kind of change percentages. Like he's okay with percentages as long as the money that we're getting is smaller dollar amounts. But as dollar amounts get bigger, he has a problem with it. And this is one thing I want to say to artists that this is not okay. It's not okay to agree to a percentage if, if, and then once dollar amounts start getting bigger, now you got an issue. That's what we're in this for. Like managers don't get shit. 
Like all you artists out there that are making 10, 20, 30, even a hundred grand a year, that still only means that your manager is getting $15,000, $20,000. And if they're putting in a lot of work, like they deserve to, to still reap the benefits once if you start making a million dollars, right? Because most of you guys aren't going to do that. Most of you guys are not going to make a million dollars. And even on a million dollars, that's still only 150 grand, 200 grand. And I was close to making that before I even started Funk Volume. So how are you going to tell me that I'm not entitled to that? I was making that money before I even started Funk Volume. So how are you going to have issues? Like, so it wasn't that there was a lack of transparency in the beginning. It's just that once the dollars got bigger, now you get upset. And now you're more easily disturbed if I say something you don't like because you think that I'm, I'm not getting what, what, it, it, what I should get. Now, that, that's not good business. That's not good business at all. If you agree to something in this industry, you write it out until the end of your contract or you renegotiate like a professional. You communicate like a professional and, and, and renegotiate terms that you feel are more comfortable. And at that time, the, the, your counterpart has the option to say, okay, I agree with that or I disagree with it. But it's, it's not cool to change terms just because we got more successful, right? right? I, I, played a, I played a part in that success. It, yeah. wasn't, just, it wasn't just magic. What if it, what if it, so it would have been okay if we continued to make low dollar amounts and I continue to make a, per, a, per, a percentage of, of a lower dollar amount, but still put in the same work? Yeah, that, I mean, I've, I've seen that happen. And it's, it is sad where if I'm in a group that's getting, you know, a hundred dollars for a show, everything's all good. But the second that, that hundred dollars gets an extra zero added to it, all of a sudden people are looking at each other sideways. And I mean, how many groups was I in where we had to disband three, four, five, six, I don't know. It was a lot. Uh, and so it was kind of one of those things where I, I eventually discovered that um, to create a, a team, I had to find people that were doing better than me <laughs> financially and in terms of, of their fans and stuff. Cause they, they already, they weren't blinded or, or, um, or, or caught off guard by the financial aspect of, you know, building success in the music business. And some people are caught off guard and especially artists. I mean, you know, I appreciate everything Hobson was saying about his emotional state and how it wasn't grounded in, you know, the logic of the contract. It wasn't grounded in numbers. It was, it was just totally something that he was feeling uh, because artists, I mean, people are like that. I don't know what it is about artists, but artists are like that. And yes, I'm here on the MEC. Yes, I've managed. Yes, I've been on your side of the of the aisle, but I'm a creative at the end of the day. So I understand falling into these emotional traps and just feeling these ways where somehow we convince ourselves as artists that we are doing all the work that because we're the creative ones, the people that maybe elevate our art to the point where it's actually reaching people, they're, they're somehow much less responsible for the success than we are. Even if they literally went out, got us an opportunity and hand delivered it to us. Somehow we feel like, all right. Yeah, that's, of course, it's a given that you're going to give me these opportunities because I'm the, I'm the artist. I'm, I deserve this. You have to work a little harder because you're not a creative. You hear that all the time in these conversations. And I'm sure, I, you know, to be real, I'm sure it hurts you, Dame. Um, and I'm sure that that funk volume situation hurt you because when that artist did what, what he did to me, it hurt me because I, I was a part of something. I was building and I was invested, not just in terms of my time and resources, but in terms of my emotions. And so as a manager who went through what you went through, when even I feel it when, when I see conversations where people are drawing a line between the managers and the creatives and saying, well, managers don't understand creatives. 
that may be the case, but you're also really just shitting on these people and, and relegating them to this category of non-creatives who somehow are not as invested and somehow are, are not as deserving to share in the success of whatever the art generates. Yeah. And, and I would also just remind people that I wasn't just a manager, right? Like I invested my money, my money is what, you know, started the label, right? Like in terms of all the legal costs, the website, I paid for hops rent a few times. Like it was my money that, that, that started the label. So I was more than just a manager. I was the label owner, but you know, the, the reason the music entrepreneur club came out of the ashes of funk volume and you know, of course, I want artists to learn the business so they can navigate the industry and make the right decisions. But I want artists to learn the business so they can appreciate the team that they are going to need to be successful. Like if you understand the business, then you understand the roles people play and you can appreciate and value your team. And that's what completely didn't happen in this situation because Hop didn't understand the business. So he couldn't appreciate me and the other people that I put around him. And he started to believe that everything was him. Right. And when you watch the podcast, the one thing that disturbs me a little, eh, disturbs is a strong word, but like when you watch the podcast, like Hop keeps saying that he should have learned the business. He should have learned the business. But I want people to know that like, it wouldn't have changed. Well, I can't say this for sure, but it shouldn't have changed any decision he made. Cause it wasn't like, it wasn't a situation where like, oh, I should have learned the business because I got taken advantage of, right? Yeah, he should have learned the business so that he can appreciate the people that were supporting him. But he was in a great position. He was making a lot of money. Even when I didn't even put up that much of a fight, I just wanted to get out of the situation, even when we went through the legal stuff, because I could have held it up and rightfully so, because I was half owner in the label. So I don't want people thinking that like, oh, I'm listening to this and Hop should have learned the business so he could have avoided certain situations or avoided me altogether. Like our business was sound. Our business was fair. Like he should have learned the business to understand that and to understand the value of the team and the foundation so that he didn't jump off the deep end like that. He well, not everyone's going to be Dame too. So regardless, learning the business is going to, it's going to protect you from the people who aren't, um, contributing to your vision and yeah. and who for, for, yeah for, for other people yeah but i just like to so for example so his the management percentage on funk volume artists was 25 percent net or 10 percent gross and that's why there was always a conversation after a tour to see okay you know what are people happy with so let me just give you give you guys an example on the 2015 tour, our booking agent that works off of 10% gross, our booking agent made $75,000. So that's 10% gross. I made $50,000. So I didn't even live up to the agreement that we had in the contract, right? Because if I was a typical manager that made 20% gross or 15, let's just say 20% growth, gross, I would have made $150,000 and rightfully so, because that's normal. That's, that's normal. It would have been normal to make $150,000. I made $50,000. So even if, if he would have understood the business, he would have understood that I was getting less than what was owed to me from an industry standard perspective. And that was the case with every revenue stream. And if he would have learned the business, he would have understood that he, him and the other artists were in a great position because I was actually getting less than industry standard. And, I'm, and I'll be the first to tell you the industry standard, you shouldn't always go by that. You should question industry standard. And there can be changes to industry standard because there's so many different variables that you should be looking at. You should never just take an industry standard percentage and say, hey, that applies to this situation. We should have a much fuller conversation and talk about the different variables that can move that percentage up or, or move it down for whatever reason. But I'm just saying, if our booking agent made 10% gross, they got 75,000, I potentially should have made like 150,000, but I made 50, which is a third of that. 
So you, that, you opted for 20% net. No, I'm so no, no, 25% net. So it was, so it was something in the, it was let it was. So the management agreement was 25% net or 10%, 10% gross. gross at whichever is higher. Right. So okay. like it, it protected me, the 10% gross protected me from potentially making nothing. Got it. Right. So if 10%, if, 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 the booking agent made 10% gross and that was 75. Like I should have made at least 75 under the contract, but I made 25,000 even less than that. Sure. Um, so I, I just, I just want people to understand that, you know, yes, Hobson should have learned the business, but it's not a situation where he should have learned the business to avoid people or me or avoid being in a bad position because Anybody that's in this industry could look at that contract and be like, damn, you had a, you had a, a, actually, this is actually great. And on top of that, he had health insurance. He had a retirement account. He had people around him that supported and loved him. Like, that's some stuff that you put in there, right? Because you're, you're financial sector dame, right? Because no, that's not typical. This wasn't in the contract. This was just how, this was just, this was just me making sure. That's that what I mean. Happened that his foundation was solid. Yeah. That's not, that's not, that's not normal, right? No, that's not it's definitely normal. not normal. So, so, but yeah. And, and again, I know that maybe 5,000, 10,000 people might see, hopefully, you know, a few extra people see this podcast to hear me explain it. And I wish I would have broken it down like this in the podcast but the conversation was flowing and I didn't want to stop it. But like for the MEC, I think this is important. Um, so I, I think it's important to share here and, and, and hopefully we get some extra views on this video, just given, given the topic. Um, yeah. We'll upload it to the funk, funk volume channel. We'll see. Um, so here's a question. Do you feel, be, so I, I think now the, the, the sort of the difference between you and Hobson in that conversation is that, and it's all perception. People might perceive you as being this, you know, the, the, the businessman with, with nerves of steel, just sitting at the table and calmly explaining things. And Hobson is the, the artist, you know, and artists are, are romantic, they're emotional, they're passionate. And I think people relate to that a lot. Uh, but I, I feel like it, that's not the case that you in fact are a very emotional person, Dame. And so I, I'm asking if you think that at any point during, you know, especially when the conflict started, do you feel like you regret any part of, of how you approached the conflict? Um, I mean, let, let's, let's just be completely honest, man. Like the, the label... And you'll see it in the podcast. Like I, like I told people five years ago, like my, my story hasn't changed. Like the label crashed and burned because I told Hobson he didn't work that hard. And if a label is going to crash and burn because I tell Hops, because I tell anybody that they didn't work that hard, that label is probably not going to exist for much longer, even if we're able to weather that storm. Like, I in in actuality, like I mean, I got you know I say this in the podcast. Like, I, I got real brothers, I got frat brothers, I got I got people I consider family. And hop hop, I consider family too. We don't run in the same circles. We're not the same type of people. But like, we should be able to fight. We should we should be able to yell. We should be able to kick and scream. We should be able to say all I said. I didn't even cuss. I just said, bro, you don't even work that hard. And it wasn't even a conversation about that. It was just a matter of fact comment. It wasn't even me trying to get him to change. It wasn't me sent, like putting an ultimatum and saying, hey, you need to. So when I look back and, and, and say, like, could, could I have approached it differently? Yeah, there are different things I should have done. But if a label's going to break up because I tell somebody they didn't work that hard, unless there are some huge changes, huge changes, moments of growth where we can withstand those words like with no cussing just like hey bro you don't even work that hard 
Like I just, I just don't think it would have, there was just too many things that he didn't understand. Um, and if it was, if it was, you know, Hey bro, you don't work that hard. It was going to be something else. So I, I could have handled it more delicately. Sure. But I, I just don't know how much it would have lasted if he was that unhappy and, and that on edge. I mean, I really don't know what I, what I could have done differently. What I say in a podcast is I could have had a number two uh, that, that had some authority on the label, like a vice president that would echo my sentiments or, or understand what I was trying to communicate to artists. Because I think over time, hearing something from the same person, hearing my voice, um, just repeatedly asking you to do something over the years, I know eventually it's just going to be like, you know, oh, here goes Dame again. Here goes Dame again. Like, so you probably need other voices of reason in the room, especially when I'm not in the room. Right. Because if you have three artists that don't know what they're talking about, talking about a particular subject, they're going to hype each other up. And that's what Hobson says. And that's what he said happened. Like when Hobson would go and talk with Disney and Jaren with limited information or a misunderstanding about something I was doing or wanted to do, like it drummed up a lot of negative energy. So if there could have been somebody in that room that could have explained things a little differently, explained the truth. It could have calmed down those fuck dame sessions. Um, so that's definitely one thing. And it was something that I knew even at the time, it just, I just didn't find the right person. And I didn't go on that aggressive of a search, but it was somebody that I, I did want to bring that person on. Yeah, I, and I think that's fair. Because, I mean, you and I have butt heads. We've had arguments. I've, the, the manager that I keep wanting to bring on, that I co-manage the artist with, uh, we've butt heads. And those conversations were actually a lot more i remember i cussed him out once like really bad and um it was because he was managing a group i was in and he was taking the side of the other person in the group who i thought was in the wrong and so i had a i had a logical reaction but then i also had an emotional reaction and we're still close friends to this day and i still trust him with management Obviously, we're still working together. So what you said about, you know, brothers being able to fight and even business partners being able to fight that that um, resonated with me. But I know I know this is getting kind of long and I, I'm sure we'll talk about this in future podcasts. I, I do want to be petty. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. There are a lot of Funk Volume fans out there that I'm sure are completely delighted to see. Dame Ritter and Hobson sitting down and, and having this conversation and pulling back the veil because a lot of people didn't, they, they saw the, the Vlad interviews, they saw the, the Illmind 8, but they never saw the two of you in the same place at the same time speaking on this together. Somehow, me, who's never even listened to Illmind 8, is getting caught in the crossfire because some people can't just let things go. I work with an artist named Soul. Many, many years ago, he had a, a, a beef with LP, who is now half of Run the Jewels. This was about 20 years ago. Every time we drop music, there are still aging hip hop fans in middle America that jump into the comments section to talk about the LP beef. They're not gonna say it to, to anybody's face, but that's what they do on the internet. So some people are just, searching for purpose in their life and they find it in the conflicts of total strangers. So given that I want to read some of my favorite comments. Yes, I'm being petty. Yes. I probably shouldn't be doing this at this point. I don't give a fuck because this has been going on ever since we started the MEC podcast and God damn it. I deserve some space to talk about this shit. So here we go. No, today, today, today it's fine. Cause it has, if, if, I mean, I know a lot of people, that listen to this podcast have no idea what what happened with Funk Volume, um, so I, I would encourage people to watch the Funk Volume podcast. Yes, watch um, it. But and some people might be shocked by some of the comments they see under our videos, like or not shocked, but like, well, where's where's this coming from? Um, but yeah, like people, it, it's it's interesting, it's scary. Um, not like like I'm scared or anything, but like just how 
people do get invested in other people's conflict, with, especially with like limited information or just, you know, one person can tell you something and just put a battery in your back. Like I've never been supercharged about anything to go to somebody else's page and cuss them out about anything. Like I might've tagged Kanye in one of my tweets or something like that, but I, I would never Kanye, go to Kanye anybody. doesn't care. <laughs> but, but I would never just go to, especially over a conflict that I'm not in. Like, I don't know these people. I don't know what, and, and what going through this has made, it, it made me even more sensitive to other people's conflict. Because as soon as I see two people in a conflict, I already think like, I really don't know these people and I don't know what happened. All I know is one person saying something, another person saying the other. But at the end of the day, it's not my business. I'm going to keep it moving. Well, and let's point this out. So even if you were a fan of Funk Volume at age 13, five years later, you're an adult. You were probably 18. You know, what was your, what was your age range? Probably around 18, because that's the, the legal age to get into most of those shows. So you were probably 18. Five years later, you do the math. You're an adult. So here's the first comment that I love. I, I, I hand-selected, I cure out of the hundreds of comments that, that we got, I hand-selected uh, several, several of my favorites. This one says, can we talk about the Hobson situation? To be honest, I don't trust this. Can you give me a reason I should believe anything that comes out of his mouth? He's trying to sell his fucking program, it looks like to me. Three question marks. Well, our program is free and it has been free. Shout out to BeatStars, so this guy's an idiot. Uh, another comment, you the one that ripped Hobson off, huh? All caps. So, you know, he's serious. This is the kind of guy that you don't want to lock eyes with. So, so I would want people to know that, and it was interesting, like even when, cause one of the interviews that Hop did, what I don't, and I'm not sure if this was his Vlad interview or something else. Like as soon as everything crashed and burned, like Hop did an interview and he talked about how he was a millionaire and how, you know, that wasn't the whole, I don't think that was the whole focus of the conversation, but it's like, in my mind, even if I'm looking at it as a third party and I see this and I'm, I'm like, okay, how can this person be talking about how financially stable they are, but then talk about getting ripped? If you were ripped off so bad, then why are you in such a great place financially? Like you would, at some point we need to, to teach common sense and critical thinking and you didn't it, it's not like this was hard to understand but like you people have to learn how to think for themselves and i i know that's probably not going to happen in my life in lifetime. light of what happened yesterday with the capital being stormed by white supremacist name <laughs> i don't know i don't i don't no, i don't know not. if this is the right time <laughs> no it's, it's probably not I'm, I'm asking for too much but damn like just for the people watching this like, please understand that, you know, if you get invested in somebody else's conflict that you don't even know, you really have to just take a step back and ask yourself some questions. Like, please just take a step back. Uh, but anyway, yeah, you got a few more that you want oh, yeah. to say? So Katarina Love says, so this is the guy who robbed Hobson out of his money. Hmm. And then Paul Guido, who's like number one bitch ass dude, because I, I remember that name i think he's he left a lot of comments and i just plucked this one out of the 10 that he left i hope he doesn't have i hope not none of these people have kids because they're gonna have some little lame ass kids running around and this is why we have a whole generation of of uh, foolishness i'm sure everyone's relieved that dicky dame won't manage again lmao um is is that a thing people called you dicky dame no 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 just, nah. just paul no, yeah, I, that's a new one. I got a blame Dame a lot. That's is, better. That rhymes. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I, and, and just to let just to let him know, like I still do manage, just not in the music world. I, I manage comedians now. I'm happy, so um, you're probably going to be upset to know that I'm happy and I'm fine, and people still do want to work with me. So there's that. Hayden Bond says, I think it should be for forbidden to sign rap artists, then steal from them. <laughs> uh, this is a good one because it's both of us. 
Oh no, this is a compound. Yeah, this is oh, this is ho ass Paul Guido again. Um, no offense, but when have either of you had a hit after 2010? I've never had a hit <laughs> before 2010. I don't know what he's talking about. You all talking like you make hits all the time. Dame couldn't even keep his record label going with the only successful artist he ever worked with. And PN1, you only got one successful song with Jeezy from 15 years ago. I don't, th- I don't think y'all can really say much about this. Ask Wheezy, Turbo, et cetera. Okay. So I think, I think just in response to that, this podcast is not about hits. This is about, because you don't need a hit to be successful. In the Wait, no, don't, please don't respond. No, but to I, that no was I'm not responding. I just, I'm just edgy. I'm, oh, I just, no, you're trying to reason with this weirdo. No, I'm not, I don't want to reason with him. I just, like the MEC is about building a sustainable business as an independent creator. It has nothing to do with hits. Um, and we don't ever talk about things that we don't know. If, if we bring in people to, bl- to plug those holes, if there's something that we don't know about. So... Did you have many more pain? Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to end with a bang. Um, okay. And this one is hard to read because I don't think English is their first language. So, so Funk Volume had a lot of fans internationally, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is, I'm not going to attempt to uh, pronounce their name. Manager needs to be as transparent as possible to the artist. This guy is a snake. I, Y, Hobson left him. And Dame, how can you get mad if you don't tell him what you are doing on the computer? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I don't oh, know what this is in reference to. <laughs> uh, me too. But I, I, I want to let people know that our, our business was super transparent. Um, Hop was in every meeting that was important. He still uses the same accountant and business manager that we had at the time of funk volume so if things were so shady you would think he would have shook up his whole team but no he still uses the same exact business management team he still uses the same merch guy like it's a lot of the same people um so yeah things were transparent but they, why why didn't you just tell him what you were doing on the they, computer that would have saved everything yeah yeah, no, I mean, thing he had access to everything. Um, there was never a question I didn't a- answer for him. Except uh, what you were doing on the computer. Yes. You, you, you yep. just couldn't be transparent. I, right. just, just let me finish the, the comment. I'm going to try to translate this into English. Um, <laughs> you're just a snake, and you and Payne are both broke as fuck. Over 30-year-old failures. So we're broke, and we're over 30. I think one of those things is true. Yes, I'm definitely. I just turned forty. Um, oh, so you're. That's a really true statement. Yeah, but I'm not broke. Um, you know, I'm. I'm not as. I'm not as wealthy as I would be had finan- had funk volume can continue to go. But um, I'm working on some things now that I think will put me back in a good place. Uh, but I'm definitely not broke. I'm not struggling. I'm, I'm completely fine. Um, well, a bit uh, of advice, Dan. If Big Jow ever walks in the room and asks you what you're doing on the computer, you better tell him. Yes. He knows what I'm... I mean, he has a better idea of what I'm doing on the computer than Hobson did. Like, Hobson just completely was not interested in any type of business or or learning and that's that's an issue um and that's why i think that's a good topic to talk about though and and then i always say i want to bring sean and and talk about all you know because i'm sharing all these horror stories from my life and i'm the only one telling them so maybe he can come on but just that that it's a reality that a lot of us as creatives just don't even want to deal with that stuff so we put our faith in someone else and this is what hobson said he put all his faith in you, the manager. You put, put all your faith in a manager or a lawyer, whoever, who's supposed to handle it. And you just sit there and, and eventually feel like you're being cut out of the conversation, even though you're the one who chose to be you know, outside of, of that conversation. And you could have gone in at, at any time and asked, but you didn't. And you know that's something that we do as creatives to ourselves all the time. And then we start resenting that person because, yes, we said we don't want to be 
in that conversation. But after a year or two, we start getting paranoid because we have no idea what's going on. We feel left out. And then anything that happens after that has the potential for being really volatile. So I would like to talk about that more. I know we're at like 40 minutes and, and we don't want to push our limits. But you can't, you can't use that as an excuse though, right? Like you can't just check out of the business. Something goes wrong. And, but it's, it's so easy for artists to do that because there's already a cloud of skepticism that hovers over the industry, right? right? The general perception of a label is that they're bad. The general perception of managers is that they're bad because they've seen and heard these stories. They make movies about them. It's that drama is interesting. So when shit goes bad, it's so easy to pounce on the label or pounce on the business people or the manager or whatever, because that's already what people are thinking. Oh, that's just another TLC situation. Oh, that's just another NWA situation. And matter of fact, I would like to know more information about because I don't think it went down how these how like I don't believe it went down how these how these stories are portrayed when they get movies made about them. Well, they're movies. They have to be. They have, it, it's like it, like you said with Ill Mind Eight, um, or like Hobson said, he dramatized the subject matter in the Ill Mind Eight record because yeah. the r- reality doesn't make for a good song. Reality doesn't make for a good movie. But people are so stupid that they watch a movie or they listen to a song. And think this is is directly representative of what reality is. And that's not what art is. If art reflected reality 100%, it would be fucking boring. We yeah. wouldn't have science fiction. But, that, but that's, that's brains. All, Yeah. I, mean, I think, like you said, we, we're probably asking for too much for a lot of people. But like that's but that's already the narrative that's painted, right? That the, that the music industry choose young artists up and spits them out right so anything that an artist says it it could be artists fault 110 percent. but if they come out and say oh the label did this the manager that you're already going to believe it because that's what you already that's how you think managers and labels operate already so it's it's a card that's so easy for the artist to play and to play up it's it's such an easy way out as opposed to, to, to taking some accountability. And that's the hop and that's the card that Hobson played until now, right? And five years later, you know, we get to explore more of what really happened. And I appreciate him for doing that and for, for experiencing some growth that would enable that to happen. Um, but other artists that are watching, like, that's an easy, that's a sucker way out. Like it, it, that, that's just, it's, it's just cowardly, Um, you know, but I would also encourage other people that are, that are looking at this, like the music industry isn't as shady as it's portrayed. And a lot of times things are the artist's fault too. Um, So just in any confrontation or any conflict online, if you see people that you don't know personally, that you don't have any vested interest into uh, maybe outside of you, you just being a fan, just, calm down and and know that that doesn't really affect you and you don't really know what happened. So stay off their pages and their DMS and don't give them death threats and call them names. Not going to happen, but this was the music entrepreneur club episode (laughs) 81 powered by B stars, B stars. Live. We're live every Monday and every Thursday at 3 PM Eastern standard time for our free music business mentorship program. You can text the number and get, updated every time we go live but mondays and thursdays 3 p.m what, what's that number dan text mec to 844-206-7800 and we'll make sure we send you an alert every time we go live and also just a reminder we're having text marketing office hours every monday going forward at 1 30 um, i'll put the information on the mec instagram so make sure you get the information there Once again, thanks for tuning in. Check out the Funk Volume podcast on the Funk Volume YouTube channel. And we're out until episode 82. Peace. Peace.